Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Volpe Creates Show, the weekly talk show about video games, game development, and the games industry. I am your host, Chris Volpe, joined as always by Baby. I don't know if you can hear Pumpkin, but she's acting the fool over there. And uh, Lucas, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing great, Chris. How about you? Oh, making it through the day. Columbus, Ohio is back into 30 and 40 degree weather, so that's something. Yeah, sucks, but <laughs> hopefully yeah. for sunny skies. Uh, and we have our, our special guest, uh, Damon Hetfield. Uh, how are you doing, man? It's It's been a while since we've had a chance to connect. Uh, I'm doing very well. It's a nice 60 degrees here yep. in Redondo Beach. Uh, so I cannot complain about the weather where I am. Yeah, we we had beautiful last week, and then it just dive-bombed this week. So, And I think it's going to be this way for another week. But that's Ohio for you. Uh, so... Damon, you're you're a man of many talents, which uh, IGN I think is is one of them. You're a longtime um, personality <clears throat> and editor at IGN. You're also a musician. Uh, you've come to GDEX before. Um, do you want to anything I missed? Do you want to get a little recap of who you are? And... No, that's a big one. I I, I, um, I host the Game Scoop podcast for IGN, which I've done for over four, fifteen years now. Uh, IGN's longest running show. Um, so is it? I, that's yeah. That's uh, awesome. Actually, yeah. Yeah, it's been going on for a long while now. So anyway, that's what I do. I've been at IGN not like a, as a host for a long time. I was hired as a news writer way back in the day and then done a little bit of everything at IGN, written reviews, previews, and features. And then somewhere along the line, video started becoming more and more important and they needed more people to stand in front of a camera and talk. And my background in theater and, uh, and music just kind of made sense for me to sort of transition into all that. That's awesome. So... This was like sort of a they needed a person you filled the role kind of thing. Uh, well, it, it was just more like you know when uh, when video was becoming more and more important and they needed people to be on video more and more. They just started calling me or you know asking me to do more and more of that. And then uh, at some point along the line, it just made sense to make that my official job. Yeah, uh, yeah. I didn't realize. Uh, I knew you've been doing games for a long time. I didn't realize it was fifteen years. That's oh yeah, that is pretty amazing. Um, I guess we just recorded episode 666 this week. Oh, really? Last week? Oh, well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Game Scoop of the Beast. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know you've also been doing the uh, what is it, next gen console watch. You've been doing yeah. that for, for a while. That's actually uh, been running on a lot longer than we expected. We started that, that in early 2020, which was an election year. And that was obviously the year um, both the PS5 and Xbox Series X were going to be released. So we thought let's let's make this show and 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 frame it kind of like election coverage, uh, where we're pitting the two upcoming next gen consoles against one another. We had our host of our Xbox podcast and our PlayStation podcast on there, um, but then the show ends up being you know uh, very successful for us. It was a really big hit. So people even kept watching it after the consoles were out, and they're still watching it today. So we're we're just stuck making that show forever now, forever till the end of time. Uh, yeah, I watched uh, I watched all of them in 2020, and I've seen quite a few of them after that, and I really enjoyed it, and I kind of like the... Uh... Hold on one second. Can you guys hear that? I don't know what is going on there. Some animal sounds. Yeah. I don't know what's happening, but that's animals for you. Uh, but yeah, I thought it was... Uh, the, the framing of, of the election I thought was pretty fun. Um, and then as you were going through it, uh, I can't remember exactly when, but you were like, I don't know, a, a month or two out. And it seemed like you guys were like, I think we're just going to keep doing this thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and now, you know, uh, I mean, there's been no shortage of news regarding the two consoles for sure. Even after just the release of the devices themselves. Um, so I thought that was, that was pretty cool. How, is there something at, uh, IGN that you wished you could have done or want to do or you feel like you got your plate full as it is I wish um <clears throat> being completely candid uh I wish like let's plays worked better for us they've been uh, a challenge for IGN you know our IGN's a huge YouTube channel we have 16 million subscribers but our let's plays you know they just don't really they don't hit very hard and I I I think it's because, you know, IGN is, has a lot of different personalities on it and uh, big YouTuber channels that do sort of like, you know, Let's Plays. It's usually just the whole channel is focused around one or just a couple personalities. 
and mm -hmm. people come in that channel and know exactly what they're getting. And I think it's a little bit harder for a bigger company like IGN to cultivate a community around a, a personality that's streaming games. Um, so anyway, I have like, I like fun ideas for like uh, kind of themed let's play shows that I would like to do, uh, but traditionally this, this haven't performed very well for IGN. Yeah, that's that's actually really interesting because I, I mean, I'm I'm older, right? I'm, I'm part of the older demographic at 40. Same, um, same. And so I always I associate IGN with news, right? I come for updates, what's happening in the industry. Um, so I wouldn't even sort of think about Let's Plays as a content from that organization. Mm -hmm. Not that saying it, it couldn't be, uh, but it also seems like you got a lot of new new talent coming in the doors that maybe could pick up that mantle or do you want to do some let's plays? Is that something you're interested in specifically doing? Uh, I, I, I found that I do not enjoy doing let's plays by myself. However, they're really fun to play with other people. So like one idea is a show for called retro roulette. <clears throat> Part of the reason we can't do this is for legal reasons, but uh, I have a retro, <laughs> I have a retro pie that has, you know, mm. Every game uh, up, to, up, every game released up until the year two thousand, probably. And uh, in the interface, it, there's just like a random button. You press the X on your control pad, and it'll just take you to a random game. And I like the idea of just a retro roulette show where you you just see where the random button takes you on 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 my retro pie. I think that'd be pretty fun. That's awesome. Why don't Why don't you do that uh, yourself? Why don't you just create a YouTube channel yourself? Uh, well, you know, I'm a I'm a dad with two kids. So like a uh, full-time job, two kids. There's not a lot of time these days for extracurricular activities. Maybe, sure. maybe sometime down the road. But I like yeah. the idea of retro roulette. Um, maybe two people and one person is like checking out whatever random game and the other person is looking up information on it, looking up the instruction mm. manual, doing some research on it. Yeah, <laughs> the instruction manuals. Yeah. yeah, they don't make many of those these days. Mm -mm. Um, and you're also doing, are you still doing uh, music? Have you put anything in? Out yeah, recently? when 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 I can find the time, uh, I put out a song in December, and I'm actually working on a new album now. My my New Year's resolution was to put out a new album this year, and I've got two songs down, two and a half songs ish. So if I can keep that pace, I should have a good amount of songs uh, for an album by the end of the year. We'll see. Yeah, I mean we're I mean we're at the end of March, but you know middle of March. That's two and a half songs worth of time for yeah yeah for an album. Uh, that that's awesome. I know you've uh, you've come and DJ uh, G Dex before, which we're super appreciative of. And that's a that's another thing. You know, talking about the pandemic and stuff, we've ha haven't had a dance party the past couple of years because mm. it just seems weird to shove two hundred people into a yeah. small space. Um, but uh, I do I do follow. I, I guess I'm behind. I got to catch up on a couple songs of yours, but I do follow when you put stuff up on there. Um, do you have any other interesting YouTube ideas, streaming ideas? Um, I also have, <laughs> I don't know why I'm sharing my content ideas here, <clears throat> but I like the idea of, um, you remember uh, the way we'd play video games, we're, we're of a similar age, the way we'd play video games with friends when we were kids is we'd pass the controller mm -hmm. uh, in, in single player games and you play until you died or beat a level or whatever and then you pass the controller to the next person. And I like the idea of like a four person local, uh, you know, simulated past the controller sort of let's play a scenario where you pick a game let's say it's Blunky, everyone you know gets a gets to try a run and when you die you have to pass the controller to the next person i like that idea yeah. too yeah that's awesome we uh we haven't done it in a while but we used to do a super mario brothers 3 mm. uh where we do that but every time you died you had to take a shot um, well yeah yeah and it would usually it usually go pretty well until the uh the level with the fish that jumps out of the water and eats you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and after that people just started dive bombing <laughs> um but yeah no i that sounds fun i uh one of the things my my wife and i like she just she's seen me play video games you know she's part of it uh just being around the periphery but like the idea of people coming over and watching other people play video games she's like why would anybody do that i was like i don't know that's just what we used to do yeah you know we would just come over and I mean, there weren't like multiplayer games the way that we think of them now. So we would just go over and watch people. Yeah, I remember like, like Resident Evil when that I came mean, out, man. Yeah, yeah, that was like a big one. That was like in college for me. And uh, I was like the only one in, in my dorm, at least in my, our floor, that had a PlayStation. So everyone would just come over to my room and they watched me 
well, we play, we pass the controller around and we do Resident Evil, we do Symphony of the Night, the original yeah. Tomb Raider. Mm-hmm. Oh, the original Tomb Raider. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, like, I like that idea. I think uh, I, I share your uh, time, is, time is limited thing. Like that's, I started this, this show because I finally, well, the, the thing that kind of got me starting the show, because I've been wanting to do it for years, but I've just been so busy doing stuff, was when um, the EA um, Blizzard, uh, Blizzard Activision, sorry, uh, acquisition happened. And finally, I was like, you know what? I should just start the show because there's always news happening and I'm just waiting too long. Um, Because originally my idea was to do something like news related. But then after like actually after the first episode, we just ended up talking for an hour and we didn't cover any of the news. And I was like, all right, well, I'll just do a show where I invite people on and chat about uh, games and and the games industry. Um, So I guess jumping jumping back to IGN, um, you know, you've been doing game scoop for for 15 years you've been doing this new uh was it next gen console watch Mm -hmm. uh theoretically until you die i guess at this point um but what what's sort of changes have you seen what's changed over those those years um that you are i don't want to say good or bad but just some of the things you've noticed have changed both at ign and just sort of as the industry itself has kind of moved along 15 years is a long time for this industry (laughs) Yeah, I mean that's like a that's a big question because like it's it's probably it's the list of things that haven't changed would probably be a lot shorter, <laughs> both at IGN and just in the gaming industry. When I so when I started at IGN, the Wii and the PlayStation Three were not out yet. It was um, the 360 was out, but not the other two consoles. So uh, <clears throat> online gaming was still kind of a novelty with Xbox Live. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, YouTube was not. <laughs> really a thing yet there were no youtubers no streamers um turning on your console was still a very lonely and isolated experience there were no friends on your console you know no and there was also no advertisements on your console as well so uh had some bonus some upsides to that uh usually generally when a game shipped the game was done there were no day one patches that was pretty nice uh, and this was even before I started before the iPhone was even released. So before uh, mobile gaming, before gaming exploded into a casual audience and became truly mainstream. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm just uh, naming I, uh, things off the top of my head. But the, how, it's like, how, how has games and IGN not changed over the past sure. 15 years? I, I guess one of the things you just mentioned is the, uh, you know, the games shipped complete. Mm-hmm. Uh I mean, I, how do you even review games knowing that there's going to be a day one patch that could potentially fundamentally change the experience? I mean, that has to make it tremendously hard now. It is, yeah, it is difficult. Um, you know, we have relationships with a lot of uh, publishers. We have good relationships with a lot of publishers, and oftentimes they'll be upfront with that. They'll provide us a game early, and then they'll be upfront about, there's a day one patch that's coming, here's what's going to be in it. But other times, uh, we just, you know, we run into problems like we just did with Gran Turismo 7. Uh, there's been some controversy about the way uh, the store, the in-game store works and how some cars cost like $40 in real world money to buy. And that stuff was actually hidden from us during our review. We didn't, we, we had, didn't have knowledge of that. So, it, wow, you know, we, we gave the game a nine and then it ends up launching and there's all this controversy over it. So uh yeah it's definitely it's, it's tricky it's harder to review games today yeah and also like I, a game can launch uh like take a game like friday the 13th the game that was a game that i reviewed several years ago and it launched in a pretty buggy messy state mm-hmm. but then like two years later it was in great shape you know so yep. now we have to like re-review games down the line uh totally uh was it a no man's sky it was yeah i mean almost a poster child for that right yep i mean yep. hell even cyberpunk the the big patch that came out what, two weeks ago, like finished the game, you know? Exactly. I, yeah. I played that game. I, I was excited. Friend bought it for me for my birthday. I played it when it came out and dude, that thing crashed every 40 minutes. I enjoyed well, the 40, the 40 <laughs> minutes I could play. I enjoyed before it crashed. What were you playing it on? Uh, PS4 pro. Yeah. I played cyberpunk at launch on my Xbox series X and didn't have too many problems, but I know that on the, the la- older, the last gen consoles there you know what? I actually, I did it on PS4 Pro and then switched over to the PS5. Mm. It still crashed on both, but... Really? Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's... Uh, 
I guess that's the way of the world. I don't know. We can, we can be old men and complain about it, but um, I think that uh, the, cause I, I, I follow, obviously I'm not a, I'm not a games reviewer. I'm not a writer, but I, I follow uh, IGN is sort of like, I want to say benchmark, but when a new game comes out, I was like, all right, what does IGN say? And then I kind of mm -hmm. look at like Metacritic um, for a lot of them. Cause I just, I don't know. There's a lot of folks on your team that I, I kind of like their perspectives on. Um, but that goes back to where you're talking about almost with the YouTubing where when you're such a giant, like if you go to a YouTuber, you kind of understand where they're coming from, who they are, what their interests might be. But mm -hmm. when you go to IGN, I mean, our games for divvied up by review based on who, theoretically might like to play it or do you guys kind of fight internally on who gets to review what uh <clears throat> i wouldn't say there's a lot of fighting i'd say it's it's um it's probably harder we have dan stapleton is our uh, executive editor of, for reviews so he's like overseeing all reviews he'd probably say it's harder to get all the reviews done than to uh you know decide who's going to do it the um, um a little secret about reviewing games is that it's not much fun Reviewing games is not that much fun. It's cool to get a game early and that's a, a good feeling, but then it's like, especially if like, if a game isn't that good, you don't have the luxury of just stopping and playing something else. You gotta like trudge through it. You gotta play it through to the end. Uh, you, you don't, you know, sometimes you're under a time constraint, unfortunately, and you, so you don't get to like, maybe you like doing all the side quests in an open world game. Well, maybe you don't have time to do all the side quests. You gotta just, push try and push through the story so anyway it it's not as uh, uh it's not as fun as it may sound reviewing games professionally so sometimes dan was like hey we got a code for uh this new big open world game who wants to review it and sometimes there's like crickets uh yeah that's really, uh, one of the things because it seems like um i mean and i don't know it seems like you maybe get like a week head start or something depending on when you get the, the product but like I mean, Elden Ring just came out, right? That's a big game. Big game. That's a that's a big game to get done in five to seven days, right? <clears throat> so you just lock yourself in a room and start playing, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, Mitchell reviewed that for us. I think he played it for eighty hours over like a weekend or something, like weekend and change. Um, yeah. It, uh, it, there's also a big difference, you know, like we were saying earlier. Like I'm, I don't have as much free time as I used to. So I'll, we have people on staff that are married and have kids, and we have people on staff that don't, you know? So it's like, I think the people that don't uh, end up doing the lion's share of those big reviews just by the nature of them having more free time. Yeah. Did you uh, ever have to review a game that, like, you were halfway through it, and you're like, this game's going to kill me? It just was not I mean, fun and punishing. I mean, I mean yeah. <laughs> I used to review a lot of games. I, I rarely review games uh, these days. For reasons that I was just mentioning. Um, but yeah, I reviewed thousands of games back in the day for IGN, and yeah, a lot of them were bad, sure. Uh, there's, no, <laughs> there's not like one that really sticks out to me. Yeah, there's not one that you feel take, took a week off your life or something? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, at the well, end of the I, day, I, still just playing yeah. video games for a living. Not that bad. Sure, sure. Well, I, I find all this stuff interesting, and I know a lot of our audience uh, does, and, and at GDEX, um, YouTube streaming is always a big thing, but also games journalism is always a big request, getting people who ask questions, you know, how do I get in the industry and whatnot? I guess I could just ask you generically, like, what's the, how do I get in the industry question? Because um, that does get asked a lot uh, in our, our audience and our community. I don't know if you mm -hmm. have like top three, uh, you did do a, a GDEX talk on it. So I guess you could just go watch mm -hmm. that. It's on YouTube. But, you know, what, what are your top tips, I guess? Well, I guess it depends on what this uh, theoretical person wants to do. Like, do they want to be a writer? Do they want to be an on-camera uh, sort of personality commentator? Do they want to review games? Because we've got, you know, we have, like, I'd say like an entry-level editor position at um, IGN. One of them is like a news writer. So you could be writing news articles for IGN. Mm. And I think today we're looking for someone with, you know, with a journalism background, has experience uh, writing news professionally, hopefully you know, has a degree either in journalism or communications. Uh, and then also they have to have the knowledge. They're going to need to demonstrate, you know, uh, a knowledge of the space that we cover. <clears throat> I don't think they need to have like an exhaustive knowledge of, of you know, of the Sega master system, but definitely <laughs> need to know about, you know, who are the big players Today, who do we cover on a daily basis here? 
rock stars, they're going to need to know everything about Xbox and PlayStation and Nintendo today and the big franchises. Um, but there's also, I would also say, this is, this is a, maybe a good tip. We, we have like blind spots at IGN and sometimes it's like big, big, big games like League of Legends. Huge game, one of the biggest games in the world. I don't think there's very many people at IGN that play League of Legends or know much about it. I can't talk about League of Legends, you know, so. Yeah. Someone uh, is like a talented writer and comes in with uh, knowledge of a space like that. That's a blind side for us. That's going to be that's going to that's going to be a, a bonus for them. I guess that's an interesting question, too, because. I mean, how do you got to make some decisions, right? You can't cover everything, so you got to be sort of strategic. But, um, you know, I see like uh stuff about Fortnite pop up every once again. It's hard to, I mean, Epic's in the news because they do some pretty big swings, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't see a lot of stuff about league very often. Um, so how do you make those, those determinations on what gets coverage? Is it based heavily on just the people that you have on the team that are kind of knowledgeable well, about that space? We also have like a lot of data on, on what our audience is interested in. And thankfully I don't, you know, there's not a lot of, overlap with League of Legends in our audience, I think. Um, but anyway, we have, we, you know, we, we have analytics and data, exhaustive data on, on the topics and subjects that we know that the IGN audience is interested in. Okay. So that helps yeah. move you down the, uh, down the funnel. Yeah. Um, also, you know, 15 years of experience, kind of, a lot of it is just, I know in my gut what's, you know, what, what's gonna, what needs to be covered. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, you were mentioning the, the knowledge base that, you know, people might want to have, uh, I, I have, I play path of exile. Uh, I'm addicted to that game and I've got a group and we were talking about last week's show with Grant and I was like, oh yeah, Grant, you know, he's done things like Banjo Kazooie and Viva Pinata. And then everyone's like, I don't know what, what that game is. I was like, how Oof, old are you? And that's they so were like, sad. I know they were like 18. They're like, I wasn't even alive when you were playing N64. I was like, oh man, you're killing me here. You're <clears> killing me. Um, I mean, that's just how it is, right? But there are some, I don't know, just fundamental things you would think you, you would want to know. But like thinking about your, your retro roulette game, you know, is IGN, or I, I, this is like a weird way of saying it because whatever. But like you have your demographics, right? But like is that retro idea, would that fit within IGN's demographics? Not, probably not really. Um, am, I, am I even in IGN's demographics at 40? You're probably in the upper crust of, uh, of our target demographic, yeah. Okay. Uh, our, our audience is nostalgic for 90s things. Our audience is like the Pokemon generation. People, okay. People like, grew up playing Pokemon. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, because, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe like, it's a case. Of... Which is like 10 years after my, like I grew up in the mid-80s, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was born in 81, so I, I grew up in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, and you would think that we would be, I mean, we buy a lot of video games, right? But I guess maybe we oh, don't yeah. go to the interwebs for gaming news. Or we just, like you, you've got two kids, you've got other things to do. Uh, yeah. But, um, awesome. Hold on one second. Baby, I don't know what you want here. Move my dog out of the way. Uh, so, it seems like, you, I mean, you are in california now because you moved out there but you're a you're a midwest boy right i'm from kansas yeah Olathe, kansas so uh when you first got the job was it something you kind of got hired for and then went out or is this something that you went out to pursue no so i was living in chicago i went to the university of kansas and after graduated i moved to chicago with a bunch of friends and started a we did a started a theater group and then a sketch comedy group and I was playing in a band and generally just like having a lot of fun with my friends in Chicago. But I was also a big gamer and a big fan of IGN. And after a few years in Chicago, some friends started moving away. And I started thinking, okay, what's what's next for me? And then one day IGN posted a, a, an article saying that they were looking for a news editor, a news writer. And I was like, I think maybe I could do that. And I applied and I was ended up getting hired and moved out to San Francisco. And that was 15 years ago. That's, that's awesome. Uh, so sketch comedy, eh? Mm -hmm. You still, you still do sketch comedy? Is that something? No, I haven't in a long time. 
but I did get a theater. I did get. A, I have a theater degree, uh, theater and music from uh, the University of Kansas. Not musical theater, theater and music, two different degrees. Theater and music. Yeah. Uh, but I, I assume like that those skills probably are one of the reasons why you're one of the major on-air personalities, right? You're just used to. Yeah, that's just. I, I was really comfortable being on camera from the beginning. Um, and I do think it's interesting that even though like I haven't done theater in a long time, I get to, you know, being on camera for IGN, uh, it, it definitely, it scratches that itch for me. Like I get to perform and be in the spotlight and do, do what I enjoy uh, as a job. And I feel really lucky to be able to do that. Uh, so I'm asking you a question and feel free, feel free not to answer if you don't want to, but I, I've noticed just in the, the short time we've known each other, but, um, there, there is always like this this period where it seems like you're you're quiet and reserved and you're sort of prepping. And as soon as the camera goes on or the talk starts, it seems like you are in the zone. Is that just something you've cultivated or is that just when you feel like you're in a comfort zone when you're sort of performing or? I th well, I think it's just a, a it's the, it's what happens when someone with my personality or I'm, I'm a little bit quiet. My wife will tell you that I'm like, uh, I never talk. Uh, and I'm not a super like outgoing, overtly uh, friendly person. I'm just I'm happy to be at home by myself, my family playing games. I don't need to be super social, but I like to, you know, be, I like to perform as I've, I've always enjoyed uh, being on stage and being in the spotlight. So and I also just know what it takes to, you know, give a performance. I know there's like a certain like a heightened level of energy and, and intensity uh, that you need to, you know, they used to say perform for the people sitting in the back row, make sure that they can hear you, you know? So yeah, mm -hmm. when it's time, when I'm, I'm not, I'm kind of a quiet person, but when it's time to, you know, turn myself on and activate, I can do that. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is cause, uh, so I, I teach at a couple universities and public speaking is always like the ghost faced death kneel for a lot of my students, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I always try to, to tell them that like, I, I mean, I'm the same way I'm an introvert at heart. Uh, a lot of people find that strange since I run this giant expo and I'm always in front yeah. of the community and stuff. Um, but generally I'm the, I'm the same way as you just hanging out at home or with some friends. I don't nothing too flashy, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but I've also done lots of talks, performances. I've done two TEDx talks mm -hmm. and it's a skill that you can yeah. develop. And trying to like get them to, to understand that and it looks like you got yours from the sort of theater side I, I sort of developed that skill from the more like i don't know business entrepreneur talk side uh but i, I think it's important for people and students in particular to understand that it's a skill like anything else and you can learn it you can get better at it it it's definitely a skill it's not something uh that came naturally to me and when i when i watch my old videos for ign oh it, it really makes me cringe because uh I, I i can say i have gotten better over the years mm -hmm. yeah i've i've uh i've i just did it there i've been trying to make a conscious effort to get rid of the, the us mm. you know uh but it's hard i just did it again but there's a a skill that, that you can learn but I, i've definitely i'm definitely with you some of my older stuff I don't, I actually don't even like watching my, myself on video. Do you watch yourself on video ever? Not by choice, but I just, my nature of my job, like I edit my own podcast. I edit game scoop. So I, I end up oh, okay. seeing myself a lot. And when at the IGN office, they always have IGN videos just like rolling on random TVs. So I end up seeing myself on camera quite a bit. Mm, okay. So you're 15 years. I, I'm just gonna ask this question in, in a strange way, but like, is there something that is sort of next or do you feel like you've fallen into a good groove and you're just enjoying, enjoying the world minus the pandemic, of course, but. Oh yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with what I'm doing at IGN and feel very fortunate. I usually, I, I tell people that in 15 years, I've never dreaded a Monday morning. I just, I have a really fun job. And I guess that by the nature of the industry that I'm covering, you know, video games don't stand still for very long. So it's always something new uh, about to come out that's new and exciting. There's always, you know, a, a new game that's prettier and flashier and bigger than the last one. There's a new a new console is just a few years away all the time. So it's it's you know, there's never a, a dull moment when you're covering video games. So anyway, I'm very I'm, I'm happy doing what I'm doing right now. 
That, that's awesome. So I, I'm glad you brought up the games because I think you and I have some similar tastes on games. Mm-hmm. Are you are you playing anything right now that you're into? Yeah, um, I'm playing uh, several things right now. But the one I I'm really digging is Horizon Forbidden West. Okay. I, I'm big like adventure game, open world games is a sweet spot for me, and Horizon Forbidden West is amazing. I love it. I'm I, probably over fifty hours into it. I think I, I, I'm, I'm, I've activated the quest that's like the final quest where they give mm. you the warning like, okay, this is like the point of no return. Yeah. So I'm just trying to clear up uh, some, like uh, getting all my weapons upgraded and, and that sort of thing before I go on the final mission. That's awesome. I'm, I'm behind the times. I'm still working on um, Zero Dawn. Mm. So I'm, I'm trying to get through that. And then I want to do Forbidden West. And then uh, probably Elden Ring, I think, is going to be my summer game. Uh, but... Uh, I also, you mentioned the the, the pretty games. Uh, I think from my understanding in the conversations we had, it seems like for you, gameplay is kind of king when you're, when you're oh, yeah. playing. Is well, that... Yeah, definitely. As I, you know, I probably should be for most people. Uh, but I also like, I, I don't want to video. I, I wouldn't say that graphics are not important to me. They definitely are. And Horizon Forbidden West is a very, very pretty game. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the Guerrilla Games. Uh, I'm totally blanking. Was it the Decima engine? I think. Yeah, I think right? so. Yeah, that is a beautiful engine. Obviously, uh, Death Stranding used it to great effect, mm-hmm. and it's. I just I love watching it. So, uh, one of my friends who plays games, he just started. He's 34. Just started getting into video games like a couple of years ago because he's been hanging oh. around me, and he played Horizon Zero Dawn. He's like. Oh my God, have you played this game? It's amazing. It's so beautiful. I was like, I haven't, I haven't played it yet, but I've heard great things. Uh, and then he did Forbidden West, and he's like inching through it because he doesn't want to like, he doesn't want it to end. That's his big, I think, open world experience yeah. that he's had, you know. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing it. Uh, anything coming out on the horizon that you're looking like forward to in the near um... future here? Yeah, I think so. Well, in the near future, I don't know about that. Later on this year, I'm definitely going to be interested in Starfield. Uh, I do, you think generally that's coming out this year. Well, I mean, they've got themselves a really nice release date, 11-11-22. It'd they be a do. shame. A real nice, nice, real nice release date you've got there. It'd be a shame if you had to lose it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I don't. They they sort of planted their flag in, in the sand on that release date last summer. So here's hoping. And then, of course, Breath of the Wild too. Don't okay. know if that's coming out this year, but it has been five years now since Breath of the Wild. I this is this is a secret shame. We're gonna go off on a little tangent here, but I really enjoy playing Breath of the Wild. But like, it didn't grab me. I think the way a lot of folks did. I don't. You're know not why. one of the people that like this is the greatest game ever made. No, I, I think a lot of it just it seemed very sterile to me in a way where like. I don't know. There weren't like a lot of characters I connected with or whatever, but the gameplay and stuff was awesome. But I could talk about Breath of the Wild all day it long. Will, it'll be interesting to hear what you think about Elden Ring because a lot of people say that it's like it's like a, a more hardcore Breath of the Wild. I um, disagree with it. With that, I think Breath of the Wild is much more about exploration and discovery. But other people get that out of Elden Ring as well. Do you have a, a preference between the two? Definitely Breath of the Wild for me. I, uh, this is famously documented on GameScoop. I'm not really a Souls-born guy, yeah. um, but I really gave Elden Ring the old college try. I played it for over 20 hours, and it's, no, it's just still not for me. Mm. Is it just the... I mean, for those Souls games, you really do have to be in a place to... I equate it to horror games, and I'm not a big... I'm a, mm. I'm a Freddy cat, so I get scared by <clears> horror <throat> games, but I equate it as like... If you're going to play a Souls game, you got to be in the mental place to be like punched in the face for the next 40 hours, like and be frustrated. Yeah. And, and that's just, yeah, I, I play video games to relax and have fun and enjoy myself. So I, I get the arguments, you know, people compare um, Horizon Forbidden West and Elden Ring because they're both open world games that came out uh, very, you know, right one after the other. And Elden Ring has, does no hand holding, just throws you into a, a, a very unforgiving world sure. and lets you figure it out whereas Elden or horizon is a very traditional open world game there's a mil- hundred question marks on your map you can just set a waypoint go there it tells you exactly where to go aloy is constantly telling you in your ear if you're working on this environmental puzzle she'll like uh, she'll audibly give you hints about what you should be doing 
Anyway, I get I get it. Elden Ring or Horizon is is a very handholdy open world experience, and Elden Ring isn't. But I prefer the Horizon model because I'm here to have fun. I'm not here to bash sure. my head against the wall for an hour, you know. Oh yeah, totally. And and I I I started with Bloodborne. I loved Bloodborne. I platinumed it. Uh, but all those games are also like a little clunky in there. Yeah, gameplay. I think so too. I, like they just I I I know people that like these games are used to it. But to me, it, like, it doesn't feel good moving around in that space, moving the character. I don't like being locked into a- attack animations. I like to <laughs> be able to back out if I want to. Um, I'm, I'm not crazy about the stamina system. You know, in, oh, in, yeah. in Horizon, uh, Aloy can just run forever, you know, dodge forever, never runs out of stamina. So, I don't know. I, I, get it. No, I, I agree. I can't, take it. I can't say they're bad because they have legions of fans that love those games. They're just not for me. I mean, and, and people have got preferences. Like, I, I'm enjoying playing uh, Horizon Zero Dawn uh, because I think that the combat's pretty smooth. Uh, but the thing that drives me crazy is I feel like the way the levels are laid out, it is just mm. crap everywhere you keep bumping into and getting stuck on, <clears throat> yeah, which is something was... I would associate with a From Software game, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, uh, so Forbidden West is better about that, but she still can't climb everything and still like can't if, if something is like knee height she can't get over it oh god that, <laughs> that's something that drives me crazy i was like i'm like can't yeah. you just jump just jump yeah uh what about uh god of war that's oh that's i love out. yeah uh, god of war ragnarok that's another one i'm super looking forward to god of war 2018 definitely one of my favorite games of the last generation might be my mm-hmm. favorite of the modern PlayStation exclusives, although I also really love Ghost of Tsushima. Yeah. Were you a, a God of War fan previous to that? Not really. They d- the previous games didn't have enough. I need a little bit more than like hack and slash action, you know? And mm-hmm. God of War had more like exploration. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, amazing dialogue and performances. And I, I love the world that they uh, created for that. The World Serpent is like the coolest video game character oh, uh, totally. of the past 20 years, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I've, I've got my TV in a home theater system. It's not like the yeah. most elaborate home theater system. But when that thing started talking and my yeah, room was like, amazing. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, that's sweet. so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I hadn't played any of the old. Um, I'm actually... So I had a PlayStation 2, never had a PS3. Uh, so I kind of missed that segment of PS3 exclusives, like the Uncharted's and, and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so God of War just kind of floated by me. I never even thought of it. But then I played the new one. I was like, wow, I, this is great. Mm-hmm. It, the combat feels great. Uh, I think the RPG elements were good. I'm, I hope they're a little more deep in the, in the next one. But I'm mm-hmm. also an RPG nerd. Sure. Uh, but... Uh, but yeah, I I always joke. I uh, Last of Us was like that. That was something that just totally grabbed me into PlayStation World uh, mm-hmm. again. Um, I own Last of Us, the first one for PlayStation Three. I don't even own a PlayStation Three, so go figure. Uh, but that's there seems to be, in my opinion, I think Sony just has a really good handle on these um, single player, more adult themed Mm -hmm. you know not in terms of violence and stuff and so i'm i don't know they they even have uh stuff like ratchet and clank to sort of balance that out too Mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so yeah i guess it's got got a war still on target i think right i haven't even checked i've been so busy so is that uh we haven't gotten an update on it in a while but it's supposedly coming out this year okay well i'm excited for that uh so what are we We're running a little tight on time? Uh, I got a couple more questions and let me double check and make sure there's nothing for the audience. But is there anything that you wanted to chat about before we get close to well, you've got you've got uh, GDX coming back in person this year? Uh, you... Yes. So we, we came back in person last year. OK, last year. And yeah, so two years ago we did uh, GDX TV and mm-hmm. we made it like a TV show. Um, I actually used some of Game Scoop as an inspiration for it. So thank you for that. Cool. Uh, and then last year we did, uh, yeah, we did it in person and we've partnered now with, uh, origins, which is a board gaming tabletop mm-hmm. convention. So sort of like with our powers combined, we could hopefully, you know, beat back COVID a little bit. 
Uh, and it went well. It was great. We we ended up with a pretty good turnout, over 10,000 people. Uh, so that, nice. that was solid. Um, this year, we're expecting over 15,000. Uh, <clears> and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it seems like... Are you doing any... Uh, uh, you mentioned that there's some stuff coming up in summer that you're involved in, but are you going to any um, shows like PAX or anything well, this year? Like uh, PAX, what, West? Um I, I, we haven't talked about that yet. Gamescom is coming back. Right, right now the plan is for Gamescom to happen in Germany in person. Uh, and traditionally I have gone to Germany to uh, host stuff for IGN there. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see if that happens. That would be pretty exciting. I haven't traveled internationally, you know, in, yeah. you know, in over two years now. So That's, that's a lot of people, isn't that? Like 200,000 plus people in a normal? It, in a normal time, they're going to limited but i think it's still gonna be like a hundred thousand people um you know but i don't know we'll see uh things are starting to ease up ign has a plan to go back to office uh next month but of course as i think of we learned we've learned uh learned during this pandemic to not get our hopes up too high because things can definitely yeah. uh regress right sure yeah yeah uh we talked before the show about um the ign offices opening up and that you were excited but it's not ideal for video production. I would much rather be in a nice studio. And we have really nice brand new studios here in LA. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to work in there. What's up, Lucas? Okay. 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 <laughs> thanks oh. thanks man um uh yeah i think i kind of took a diversions from your your question to me but yeah gdex is happening this year it's in june uh i was uh we moved it because uh origins that's their normal weekend um which i was a little worried about because that traditionally conflicts with e3 but it doesn't sound like there's an e3 this year so i guess yeah uh the esa has been completely silent about what their plans are. Uh, I know if they do something, it'll be online again. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I want to be clear. I don't have any like insider information about whether or not E3 is happening. Oh, but yeah, that, yeah. Sure. that time, traditionally, if E3 doesn't happen, traditionally someone wants to like take that spot and do something right around that same time. So mm. I, I would assume there's going to be something happening around then. Okay. That sort of early to mid June window. Yeah, I, I, it seems uh, obviously the pandemic threw everything out of whack, but even before that, uh, I mean, Nintendo's off doing their own thing. Their directs, uh, mm -hmm. PlayStation had, um, well, I'm totally blanking on the, their show. They did it a couple of years in a row. Yes. Like, yeah. PlayStation PSX. experience. Yep. They did that like November, December ish for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it seems like everybody's trying to do their, their own thing. I don't know. I mean, I guess are, are these kind of, big shows because e3 was traditionally like a retailers kind of show that sort mm -hmm. of transitioned into a consumer show mm -hmm. uh do we need those kind of shows anymore is that is this is the world well, a different place i guess i can't speak for like the sort of like retail part of it i i would say that i i i still enjoy e3 it's still like exciting for me it used to be uh like you know christmas or the super bowl for gamers it used to be the the time of year, a week where you got all the biggest gaming announcements of the year. I know it's less important now because, as you're saying, everyone can hold their own events anytime they want and just speak to uh, customers, their, their audience directly online with Nintendo Directs and State mm -hmm. of Plays. So I guess in some ways it's cool that we get more exciting events happening year-round. They're not on the same level as what an I3, E3 used to be, but... Every time there's a new Nintendo Direct, that's a sort of like mini event for IGN that we get to cover. And it's exciting, you know, from just from a gamer standpoint. And it's also, to be honest, it's good for our traffic. And, and you know, uh, there's always a lot of interest in these uh, sort of events. So I don't know. I, 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 I think the ESA is kind of a, well, maybe I won't say that. I hope, <laughs> I hope the ESA and E3 finds a way to stay relevant. How about that? Life finds a way. Uh, yeah, you don't need to step into anything there. Um, yeah, I, 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 
I think I, I get what you're saying too. I there is something nice about having like, oh, it's E3 time, right? Like this is when the big stuff I mean, yeah. is going to pop up, and yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna learn about the games that we're going to be excited for for the next year or two. You know. Yeah, and I've I've found this is just my personal thing. I've found uh, some of the Nintendo directs, uh, even some of the state of plays. I mean, you know, you do a state of play, it's like 15 minutes long. I mean, how excited are you going to be? Most of the time, it's not yeah. that that exciting. So it's mm -hmm. nice to have that that big sort of tentpole event. Um, but I also get why, I mean, E3 is expensive. It's expensive to exhibit there. It's expensive to attend. Like, why why spend your money? And I think, I can't remember what, uh, when PlayStation did their one with the, uh, they had like the uh, uh, orchestra and stuff. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. a couple of years ago i can't was that for last of us it might have been for, for last of us, well right? i think they had like a, a a band for last of us but they had an orchestra for god of war god of war yep that's what <clears> it was <throat> uh so they tried they made it a an event and i thought that was pretty cool um uh, but yeah you know i know and i know it was also like timing like e3 has its time that it's happening and you know maybe that doesn't line up maybe that isn't a good time for a, a publisher to like step away from development and show off their game you know, maybe it's not, maybe that just timing just doesn't work for them. And with their Nintendo Directs, State of Plays, whatever Xbox calls their things, they they get to decide on their own when it's time to show off their game, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Are there any, uh, uh, hesitate to say, smaller shows that you just personally like, regardless of your IGN stuff, anything you like to attend? Um, well, I mean, it's not a smaller show, but uh, Comic-Con was always fun to attend in San Diego. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I don't even know what's going on with that one this year. That was a really big show. That looks like a super spreader event to me in hindsight. Yeah. Uh, in hindsight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah we were Pac going to PAX East. Uh, that was always a really good time. I, I love when we can go to PAX East and do like a game scoop panel there. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah, that's year. where... That that's where I, I met you at uh, one mm -hmm. of the IGN parties uh, yeah. at PAX East. Um, yeah, I, I PAX just has a good. It's got a good energy to it. It's fun. There's, it's a good cross between like businessy and just kind of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I, I, we were for GDX. We were very cautious about um, COVID safety stuff, and luckily we didn't have any no breakouts. Nothing. Nothing to mention. So yep. I think. Yep. I think. I think we were good. Yep. GDC um, happening right now. In San Francisco, you know, so yep. hopefully that hopefully that doesn't end up being a spreader event. I hope not. Yeah, that's the tricky one with like GDC is it is just it pulls people in from all over the world. You know, just mm -hmm. everyone's coming from all over. Um, so I, I asked my question. I'm just going to put you on the spot, but uh, I'm, I'm doing it more as an informational uh, mm -hmm. piece. But why uh, why did you choose to come to to GDX the first time I asked you? Could have done anything else in the world. Why? Uh, well, what, I mean, what, what was what was <laughs> I, interesting? Well, that was, you know, I, 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 I'd never been to GX before. And I, I think any, anytime someone asks you to like come and give a talk and share your knowledge, that's, you know, on some level, that's like flattering. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I thought that sounded like a fun thing that I hadn't done before and would be like even like a cool thing that I can like add to my resume, you know. Sweet. Well, I'm, I'm glad you came. I, I appreciate it. Like I said, you've come a couple of times. You've, you've DJed for us. And I, I think. Um, I, I sort of use that for some of my students, uh, as an example of like, cause you were someone I'd been watching for years, right. On, on game scoop and stuff. I didn't know you at all. Um, uh, so I just came up to you and said, Hey, at the end of the event. Um, and so I use that to, to let people know, just be, be engaged and be interested and go talk to people, you know, build your network. Mm -hmm. Uh, your network doesn't have to be a businessy thing. It should be a, a fun connection thing. And yeah. you never, you never know what will happen. I'm that, GDEX literally exists because either I get connected to somebody through someone or I just like randomly ask them mm. if, you know, if they want to come and I've somehow built a show out of it. Mm. But, uh, all right. Well, I think we're getting towards the, the end here. Uh, Damon, I appreciate you being on anything, uh, else you want to mention, uh, ways that people could find you or connect to you, or, uh, you want to share your, your music site or anything with the audience? I mean, yeah, sure. You can find me on um, Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter, Dame Zero. Um, same thing on Instagram if you want to hit me up there. And of course, GameScoop, the GameScoop podcast comes out every Friday. You can find it in your favorite podcast service or at uh, youtube.com slash IGN games. 
And then my music is just under my name, Damon Hatfield, whatever music service you use. You can find me in uh, Spotify, Apple Music. Just search for Damon Hatfield and uh, please to enjoy some 80s inspired synthwave. Awesome. So you're still working on that, that big Spotify contract uh, you're going to get yeah. someday? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> they need that awesome. big uh, homepage placement on Spotify. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you again, Damon. Thank you, everybody, for uh, watching. It's been an awesome episode. Uh, the Volby Creates show is every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I've been your host, Chris Volpe. Uh, baby's over there taking a nap. Lucas. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. So we'll see you next week.